From Above by a Mad Painter, a.k.a. T.R. Becker. Kim Lou sat with her legs dangling over the cliff edge, just outside of the cave her family called home. The wind blew the long golden hair that ran up the back side of her upper arms. She was not very big, only a little over a meter tall, and covered in light pink downy hair. She would soon be seventeen seasons old. She held the end of her tail in her hands. The end was a puff of hair the same as on her arms. It was changing colors, and soon would be bright red, telling any males that she was of mating age. This did not suit her well at all. She had no desire to spend her days hanging on the cliffs like her mother had done all her life. She had always watched the men as they would go off into the jungle to hunt and longed to go with them. When she was ten seasons old, she had found an old spear and had joined the group of men as they were about to descend one of the trees to the jungle floor. They all laughed at her, and her father took the spear away and beat her with it. That day she decided no matter what, she would one day go into the jungle just like the males. She would hide and watch how they used their weapons and would listen to any tales of the wildlife. She knew the beasts that they would bring back to eat. She may not have seen most of them alive that the hunters said were dangerous, but she would know them when she did get to see them. She would always watch as the males jumped into the trees and made their way down to the jungle floor so far below. Females never got to leave the cliffs. It was not fair. The caves were just above the treetops, so most of the view was an unbroken mat of red-green leaves. There was a vast blue area to the south that the hunters said was a huge body of water, like one of the springs that was where they got their drinking water. She would climb to the top of the cliffs at times. It was her own little world. No one else would ever think of doing that. There were trees on top, but they were a lot smaller. The biggest thing she had ever seen up there were tree huggers. Sometimes it was all the hunters would return with from a hunt. When fixed right, they were tasty, but the ones up top were her friends. She would never tell anyone they were there. She had made her own weapons, spears, sling, and a small bow. She had spent hours learning to flint and nap, arrowheads, and had even made herself a fine knife. She looked out over the red-green sea below her. Off almost to the edge of her vision, she could see another set of cliffs that rose up out of the trees. The hunters said they were haunted with the souls of hunters that had died on their quest to return with food. She was not sure if she believed this or not, but the hunters did. She was grateful to the hunters. They came back with not only food, but skins and furs to help keep them warm. Her mother had showed her how to sew them into different things, from shirts to blankets. She had become good at it and a couple of the males would bring her furs to make their mates dresses. When the hunters returned, there was always a feast and they would tell tales of their trips. The whole tribe was no more than 200 at any time, so everyone knew everyone else. There were tales of other tribes to the far south, but no one alive had ever seen others. It is said there had been many wars over the hunting grounds, so now the tribe tribes had a set area that were used and none would pass the old marking stones that they said were set up so many seasons ago. There were some who didn't believe the old tales of wars and that the tribe was all there was as far as people in the world. She didn't believe this. The world was just too vast and she was sure there was others out there. When she could no longer see the hunting party she stood up thinking one day they won't be able to stop me from going. They would be gone for about three or four sunups, so the only males were the ones that were too old or had been hurt in some way. They never left the cliff anymore. No better than the females as far as the males were concerned. 
The light wind was still a little cool, but it was spring and soon the wind would rise up warm from the cliffs. Suddenly her younger brother burst from the cave opening. Something flew just past his head. Just in time she reached out and grabbed a handful of his hair and jerked him to a stop and he fell to his ass or he would have run right off the cliff. Slow down, boy. If you ever want to join in the hunts, she said. He was only six seasons, and he looked scared. He jumped to his feet and hid behind her as the, their mother came out. Next time I catch you in a honey, I'll throw you off, and Kim Lu won't stop me. She shook, shook a stick at them and turned and went back in. Kinlu pulled Tito from behind her and said, You know better than to eat the honey. We need that for cooking bread and cakes. She gave him a firm look. He looked down at his bare feet and said, I know, but it's so good that way. Well, then maybe you should start your own hive. He looked up at her smiling. You think I could? Why not? I'm sure one of the elders can show you how and maybe even help you do it. You're right. I'm going to ask one of them. Thank you. Off he ran down the path that led to the common shelf. He was really a good young man and one day would make a fine hunter if mother didn't kill him. There were a few clouds forming to the east, and at this time of the season it would mean a little rain before sunset. This could be good for the few fruit trees, that were planted around the cliff. She decided to climb to the top of the plateau and work on her arrows. She had two quills full, but she wanted to have three when she went on her first hunting trip. As always, she made sure no one was watching as she made her way up. It would not do to have her mother know what she was up to. She would be ready to go on her foray into the jungle before the men returned. When she reached the top, she stood and looked out over the trees. There was still some fog here and there, and she thought that it may even get a little warmer today than it had been. She pulled her hair back and slid on a headband so it would not blow around her face as she sat down to work. The wind brought the smell of someone's cooking fire. It would be lunchtime soon. She was not there long when the wind changed, and she could smell that a rock climber was near. It was out in the day, she thought. That was strange. They hunted mostly at night. Not too much of a threat to her, but still some things best left alone. They would eat anything they could, even each other if needed. She heard it before she saw it. It moved on many legs. With a tail that was tipped with a needle that they could use rather good. It looked more like an insect than a mammal. Its fur was used to line clothes for the winter. It moved out from behind a tree and hissed when it seen her. It was a big one, almost two meters long. It raised up the first third of its body in an attack stand. It was not going to move on. It was hungry. She was going to grab her spear and decided to use the bow. When it moved, it was fast, but not as fast as she was. Her first shot hit it between two of its legs, which made it roll to the side, and her second pinned its head to a tree. It thrashed around with its tail trying to reach her for a moment before going still. She would never have killed it if it would not have tried to make a meal of her. She could not take it home to eat. If she came home with it, there'd be way too many questions of how she killed it. Rock climbers never came near the tribe, so she would also have to explain where she was. She decided to just leave it there. Something would find it a tasting meal. She needed to get back to the cave or her mother would be upset with her. She was to help her weave some new baskets and then they were going to make some, new, some wine. At the end of the day she sat looking out over the trees. 
she had decided that she would go before dawn on her own hunting trip. When she returned, they would never think that only males could be hunters again. She would be going after one of three prey animals. The easiest was a ringtail lizard. They were not too smart, but they were big, four meters, and had a mouthful of sharp teeth. The second was the horned beetle. It was a good meter round. Its horn was half as long and it would use the horn to call for a mate, but it also was a good weapon. Their meat was sweet and tasty when ate raw. Their skin on their shells was great for making footwear. It's what she had on now. The main beast she would like to find would be the jumper. They were huge, mean, and considered everything as food. Two or three males would be killed a season. They had four arms that were long, tipped with talons. Their hind legs were powerful, made for jumping between the trees. She had seen them all dead, but had seen the ringtail alive in the treetops once or twice as she sat. Not many things came to the top of the trees, most like the shadows below the tree leaves. The hunters said the jungle floor was mostly in a permanent shadow with patches of fogs much of the time. It took her some time to fall asleep. She was restless, but when she dreamed it was of her returning from the hunt and the whole tribe was cheering that a female could be a hunter. She was a hero for what she had the nerve to do. It was still dark as she gathered up her pack and weapons. She was not going to use the same way the males used to climb down. She had looked the whole plateau over and found a few places that she could reach the treetops with ease. She was careful as the rocks were still wet with dew. She sat down when she reached the treetops to wait for the sun to fully come up. She did not like not telling her mother or brother where she was going, but knew if she did, the rest of the tribe would have stopped her. Nothing was going to stand in her way to show them a female could be a useful hunter. It was a long way to the jungle floor. It would take her hours to reach it. She thought, looking down into the dark. Most of the insects stopped chirping as the birds began, not wanting to become something's breakfast. She didn't bring any food, knowing she would be able to find many things to eat. But she did bring water, not knowing if any in the jungle was safe. She jumped and lowered herself down each limb. It was not that different from climbing on the cliff face to her. She thought of the climb back up, carrying a kill with her. It would be hard going, but still thought it'd be worth it. She passed through a couple of layers of fog. Each had their own smell. She stopped at about 30 meters above the ground. She had no idea that they had lived so high on the cliff face. The air was warmer and seemed heavier. She was sweating as if it was midsummer. A couple of the birds come rushing out of the dark around a tree below her making all kinds of noise. A moment late, later what she thought had to be some kind of rock climber, but this one ha only had six legs and she thought it was running faster than any she could remember. It was going after the birds it seemed. The males had said that the jungle was eat or be eaten. If it moved, most likely it wanted to eat you. The air moved little. The wind that blew on the cliffs never reached the jungle floor. There were groups of mushrooms and groups of flowers she had never seen before. All in all, it was pretty in its own way, and she was happy that she got to see it. Being unsure of the place, she kept her left hand resting on her knife and held the spear in the other. She decided to follow the cliff. She could not get lost if she kept it in sight, and getting lost was not something she wanted. 
she was surprised at how many birds were singing. There was never that many at the cliff top face. There was only a couple hours of light left, so she knew that it would she would have to spend the night down there, and the cliff was the safest place. She would only have to find a place that was not too close to the trees and climb up for the night. After a few minutes, she ran into a small stream that came from a three meter waterfalls from the cliff. The pool below was full of bright colored fish. She had never seen fish before. The waters on the cliff held no life. She could not help but stand there and wonder watching them. They were amazing to her. Things that lived in water, not air. The stream was not wide and she was able to climb a tree on one side and drop on the other. The whole time trying to watch the fish. They flew through the water as birds flew through the air. She wondered how the fish would taste or if they were edible at all. When out of the tree, a large red bird swooped, grabbed one of the fish and was gone into the trees again. She thought that if the birds could eat them, they must be good for her too. She dug in her pack and found a length of string. She tied one end to an arrow and the other to a tree root at her feet, and minutes later she had her a fish. After looking over it good, she thought it best to cook it. She prepared it as if it was one of the ring-tailed lizards and was delighted by how it tasted. She saved some for breakfast after making sure her fire was out. As she was sitting there eating, she noticed there was a shelf a few meters above the falls. She would just have enough time to reach it before dark. When she reached the shelf, she was surprised that it was almost a cave. On the inside, it showed the waterfalls flowing down into the falls. The sound of the birds and the water was relaxing to her. She wondered what her mother was thinking now. Was she worried that she had fallen to her death? She was sure that was not the case, or hoped she didn't think that. Tito would know that she had gone of her own will, and she would return. She felt safe above the falls. She had found no sign that anything had been up there other than a bird or two. With the last little light, she watched the pool of water. The fish gathered in the deepest part of the, for the night. She used her pack as a pillow and stared at the darkening sky where she could see it. She did enjoy watching the stars at home. It didn't take long and she was asleep. She was not sure how long she slept, but she was awoken by the smell of smoke. It was rising up the cliff from the pool. It was a cook fire by its smell, she thought. She just laid there for a few minutes, not wanting to give herself away. She wondered if it was the males from her tribe, or if it could really be some other people. She heard some talking, but was unable to understand any of it. They were talking too low. After a few minutes, she had to see, so she moved as slow as she could, as not to make any noise. She took a quick look over the edge. There were three men sitting around a small fire. It was so fast that she could not, could not tell who they might have been. After a few minutes, she got up the nerve to look again. This time, she looked good. They were not from her tribe, she was sure of that, knowing all the males that went hunting. They looked at Eve sitting there as if spending a night on the jungle floor was no big deal. She could only see spears, no bows, and no packs. That could mean that they were not too far from home, and they were not out there on a hunting trip. If not hunting, then why were they there? She wished that she could hear what they were saying, but if she could, would she be able to understand them? The whole scene had a strange feel to it. She pulled back from the edge and looked up, seeing a shadow moving down at her. She froze. It was a large green-eyed spider, and it was a big one. 
She barely had time to pull out her knife and did not have time to point the blade at the thing. She hit it in the middle of its body and pushed hard. The thing flipped in the air and went right over the edge of the cliff shelf. A moment later, she heard all three of them yelling. It was hard for her not to laugh at the thought of them startled by the beast falling from the sky. She couldn't wait. She had to look. They were all stabbing at it with their spears as it ran around the fire. By luck, one of them got his spear under and flipped it up and the spider landed in the water. It was not in the water but a moment when the surface exploded and the spider was gone. Something had ate it in one mouthful. The three men were shocked and backed away from the water's edge. One of them began to throw more wood on the fire. She slid back from the edge, not wanting to be seen. The night was only half over with, and it took her a few minutes to fall back asleep. The next thing she knew was that the men in the camp once again became loud, waking her up. She slid over to take a look. They had been joined by two other men who had a third man whose hands were tied behind his back. They yelled at each other for a moment. One of them tied the prisoner to a tree. After a few minutes of talk, two remained and the rest faded into the woods. So they were out there looking for people for some reason, she thought. When the prisoner looked up at the sky, she was shocked. The man there was none other than her father. She had to fight with herself to keep from yelling out to him. It was still an hour or so before sunrise. Why had the men taken him prisoner? And who were they? Where had they come from? Her mind had met way too many questions. She was going to have to help him somehow. She could climb down a cliff, but was not sure if they would spot her. It would take her a few minutes and the whole time she would be in the open. The only other way down was the waterfalls. She could climb down inside the tunnel, and then at the opening she could get a good eye on the men, and with a little luck she could put an arrow in each. Then she could jump into the pool to get the rest of the way down. She would have to hope that whatever went after the spider was not so big she would, that it would want her to give her a try for breakfast. She carried only two arrows and her bow slung over her shoulder. It didn't take long to reach the opening from the falls. Being wet made her cold in the morning air and she was shaking a little from it. She peeked out at the men, who was just sitting there staring at the now smaller fire. Her father looked up. Her father looked as if he was asleep. She had never killed anyone before, but could think of no other way of freeing her father. Death was part of life on the cliffs, so she had seen it many times in her short life. She notched the first arrow. She pointed it at the man whose back was to her. When the arrow hit him, he just leaned forward a little as if he had fallen asleep. About the same time she had the second arrow notched, he fell to the side, making the other man jump to his feet as she let go. The aim was true, hitting him in the heart. He half turned and then fell dead. Her father was son stunned to see her pull herself from the water. His mouth fell open and he was unable to speak as she rushed over to untie him. You must hurry before anyone comes, was all she could think of to say. She pointed to the shelf. Up there will be safe for now. She had to pull him to the cliff face. Get moving, she told him as she went back to the men. She found their spears. She thought they may need them. Minutes later, just as the sun rose, they were on the shelf. She gave him some water and he drank his fill. How did you find me? Why are you here? I was not looking for you. It just happened, she smiled. I'm here to show you that, it, that females can be hunters too. He nodded his head. 
I no longer have doubts from what I've seen today. She thought he could, she could hear proudness in his voice. It was the first time that she could remember him ever being that way about her. We must get back to the tribe and let the elders know what has happened. You must rest first. I believe we'll be safe here for now. Have you seen any of the other hunting party? Most were killed in the first attack, but Keiko and me were able to get away. We led them away from the cliffs as best we could, but soon we got lost in the trees. We were running and I tripped and hit my head, and when I woke up I was their prisoner. He slept for a couple of hours as she kept an eye on the bodies every few minutes. By midday they were gone. Some beast had taken them, she thought. If it had been other men, she would have heard them. When her father woke, they started to climb to the top of the plateau. It was slow going with his injuries. She kept looking back to make sure they were not being followed. They found a small cave and decided to spend the night. She was happy that he had, she had saved the fish from the day before. She was fine, but father was weak, so she made him eat it. Who are they, she asked. The others that the tells tell us about. I must say, I never believed that they were true. I always thought that we were the only people. He looked down at his hands. I don't believe they wanted to be friendly. They want our hunting grounds. Why do you think they would need our hunting grounds, she asked. I'm not sure why they would want to mess with us at all. We are not all that big of a tribe. We should be no threat to anyone. We should be safe to spend the night here. Get some sleep, she told him. She looked down and could see nothing. Maybe they had not been seen and that they had not returned to the camp to check on their prisoner. She looked up at how far they had to go yet. It shouldn't take more than a couple hours yet. Once they reached Plateau, it would take her only an, a little more than an hour to reach her tribe. Then she could bring back help. She kept a lookout for any spiders, but didn't think there'd be any this high. Now rock climbers, that was a whole different thing. Father was out like a rock, but she laid there for some time, unable to stop the questions running in her mind. The world had other people, or at least the world that she could see did. This alone would change the way the tribe thought, and about how they lived, or if they would live. She didn't think the others knew where the tribe was, but thought that she'd better ask Father about it just in case. Just before dawn, she was woken by a sound that she had never heard before. It was the sound of metal on metal. She jumped to her feet with her bow in hand. The wall on the cliff began to move. Her father joined her holding one of the spears. The light that poured out was so bright that they had to shield their eyes from it. Right in the middle of the light was a huge shadow. In a voice that was pleasant but with authority, they heard, Please, don't fear me. I mean you no harm. As all they could do was stand there. Lights dim 50%, please. The lights became dim. They could now see the shadow with the shape of a man but one that was huge. Kim Lu spoke first. Who are you and what do you want? The words almost ran together. She was scared. Please come in and I'll explain who I am. She looked at her father who was just standing there with his mouth open as his tail flicked back and forth. I assure you, no harm will befall you. It was something in his voice that made her want to trust what it said. Still holding her bow on the shadow, she said, lead the way. It turned, and for the first time, she was able to make out a little of what it was. It was shaped like a man, but it was not flesh and bone. Just what it was, she had no idea. It held no weapon, 
but as big as it was, it didn't need any. She followed it in, and Father came, but he was slow at doing it. She was amazed by the room they entered into. It was huge. It was large, shiny rocks of some kind that made a lot of noise and had little flashing lights that danced around the surface of them. They were made from the same thing as the man thing was. It stopped and turned back at them, and she seen it had no mouth. Its eyes were just dark patches on its head. My name is Placer. It held up a hand, and this is the Matrix Hub. You can put down your weapon. It cannot harm me. She could hear it, but it had no mouth. How could that be, she wondered. What are you, she asked. I'm a state-of-the-art cyber consciousness, a one-of-a-kind manufactured man. I realize that you have no clue what that means, but for now, what you do need to know is that I'm here to help you and your people. Father finally spoke. What makes you think we need your help? They spent the next couple of hours asking Placer questions. It took Placer some time to convince them that he had always been there in the, inside the plateau, but had been in a kind of sleep for many thousands of seasons. That was just one of the many things they found hard to believe. Placer told them that he was from a time when the world was full of people, not much different than them. They had almost destroyed the world in their greed for power, which did bring about the downfall of their race. Your people that are at a point where what you do now will set the pace for the future for the rest of your race to follow. I would like to help set it on a course that could help avoid problems that plagued the people who created me. She felt that she he was telling the truth and she believed that father thought so too. Just how can we do this? She could not think of much he could do to help them unless he had weapons to help fight the other tribes. I have had many thousands of seasons to think of ways that the problem could be avoided, and I have come up with many ways to forestall it, but in the end, it will have to be up to the people. Okay, then how can we forestall this greed from taking control of the people, Father asked. This is why I need the help of you and your tribe, to keep the greed of power away from someone that will abuse this power. It is, it is needed to be given over to a power that is above worldly desires. She shook her head. I don't understand what you're talking about. Placer looked at her and said, I believe it is time for your people to meet God. Kim Lu sat with her second son looking out over the unbroken mat of red-green leaves, wondering when the priests would return with a new list of laws that was promised to the children of God. Father and her were the only two who knew of Placer. With Placer's guidance, the words of God had spread to many other tribes and gained followers through the world. She had even taken a mate from a tribe that was many days marched through the jungle. After some time she even found herself believing in the words of God and it was a good thing. <laughs>